If you've been coming here for a while, you know that we usually start with the backstory. And the reason why is because it sets the theme and it really frames the journey that each person takes. And for Zachariah, Zach, your backstory really forms the backbone for why you started your company, Bro. And your backstory has to do with the medical ailment that the dean just mentioned that's awkward, it's full of stigma. We're talking about erectile dysfunction, ED. Yeah. I think this is the first time we've ever said this at a Cornell Tech event. Yeah. Probably won't be the last today. Um, you started your company to help men like you uh, get treatment for conditions that are frankly uncomfortable to discuss. This is because you experienced ED as a young man. So tell us what happened and how this led to your forming a company. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll give the backstory. Um, I'll start with uh, that everyone is doing much better now in this story, and I can tell it with a smile on my face because everyone's alive and, and doing well. Um, but each person in my family has had some life-threatening illness at some point in time in their life, fortunately all at different times. Um, but my mom has neurological disease, um, my sister, the biggest trooper of them all has had cancer twice, a brain tumor, an autoimmune disease. My dad's had three heart attacks and a stroke, and I had a congenital heart disease. So that's a lot, mm -hmm. um, but it allowed me to see the healthcare system as a patient, um, as a loved one of a patient. And then, as you mentioned, my dad was a, a physician, um, and he was specifically a physician in sexual health and sexually transmitted diseases. Um, which creates a very different childhood uh, for anyone who uh, might, might have Not had your that. typical dinner time conversation. No, so some people have like birds and the bees conversations and um, my dad had diagrams of genital warts before you hit puberty to scare the living <laughs> death of you. So, and I, and I remember actually, I'll size up one story because it all sort of illuminate the different childhood that I grew up in, which was I had this one photograph in my childhood bedroom um, and I always saw it as a superhero that was scaring away these little, this little ar enemy army, right? And for the longest time, I just thought it was this big superhero, enemy army, um, thought it was cool, whatever. And this was, it was in my bedroom for as long as I could remember, maybe one or two years old. And when I was about 12, I knocked it over and the photo landed face down and I read on the back that it was, uh, actually the photo was an award for a documentary on safe sex and sexually transmitted diseases. And so I flipped it over, and it turned out that that superhero uh, was a very scary condom <laughs> scaring away little herpes um, and, and sexually transmitted diseases. They so never that made was, a TV show out of that. No, they didn't make a TV show. And my, and my parents thought that that was appropriate to put in a child's bedroom. <laughs> so very, very different childhood. Um, but it created a really safe environment for me to bring up my health concerns. So as you mentioned, when I was about 18, I started to experience symptoms of ED and a few other symptoms, um, which actually triggered my dad to schedule a cardiologist appointment where I had a stress test. I don't know how many of you have had a stress test, but you basically, hopefully not many, but you run on a treadmill, uh, it gets steeper and faster, and you put your heart under stress. So for me, my heart peaked 230, 240, uh, and then I collapsed and sipped off the treadmill um, in a doctor's office. How old at this office. time again? Sorry? How old were you? I was about 18 years old. Okay. Um, and I was very lucky because it happened in a doctor's office, yeah. which is great. And then uh, a few days later, I had a heart procedure. I had an ablation procedure where they basically uh, burn the parts of your heart that are causing it to beat irregularly um, or too quickly. And um, fortunately, my heart was fixed. Uh, unfortunately, the main medication that they prescribed, the main side effect was erectile dysfunction. Again, yay. Um, <laughs> so navigated that through college and then about, was able to go off the medication. And then about three years ago, uh, this was at the time when I was at the Venture Studio, I started to experience heart symptoms again. And I went through a stress test, blood test, halter monitor, the whole thing. Um, and this was actually at the same time that my two co-founders, Rob and Simon, um, were having their second and fourth kids, respectively. So all of us were entering the healthcare system for different reasons, either as patients, as partners, but um, we knew we wanted to start a company, and then we were interacting with the healthcare system, and we knew we wanted to start a healthcare company, but we didn't exactly know where to start. And then I was re-prescribed that same medication mm -hmm. I was when I was 18 years old. Um, and when the doctor first prescribed that medication, I blurred out everything that they said afterwards, um, even though it was about my heart. So at first I was actually, uh, to be completely candid, I was embarrassed by that response, right? Because my heart procedure had such a profound impact on my life. And here I was, um, the first thought was about intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, but I reflected on that response and I actually think that that's a pretty normal one, which is something that was gonna affect my life a lot in the present before I could think about something in the future. 
So I brought that up to Robin Saman, and we thought that actually ED was a perfect place to start in terms of our, our one-line mission. It's very simple. Um, it's, to be, it's to be a patient's first call. Mm -hmm. um, so we needed to build a tremendous amount of trust, and so we thought that this was an opportunity to similarly provide the same function that my dad did to me personally, that one-to-one, -one, really close, trusted relationship um, that solved a present pain point, but allowed us to establish a relationship that we could build on um, knowing that ED, as you mentioned, is often a sign of a more serious underlying condition. So it allowed us to build that trust and build on that relationship, which we are in the very, very early stages of doing. But um, that is a long backstory to why we started where we did. Okay, so you have this specific condition in which ED became a symptom and yeah. a, a side effect of the medication you were taking. How does your company, yeah. Ro, and specifically Roman, the vertical that helps men, help people uncover these more serious conditions simply by making them, by making it easier to treat something like ED? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Maybe I'll start first by zooming out a little bit and talking about how, how it works from a patient's perspective and okay. then highlight how If someone we, feels like they have an ailment and they exactly, want to Exactly, how we get at that yeah. underlying condition. So um, if you, uh, so maybe you see one of our ads on Major League Baseball um, and you Google Roman, um, ideally scroll down a little bit and don't click the paid ad, click the organic link, that would be much appreciated there. Um, but you, you go to our website and you click on the treatment that you're interested in talking to a doctor about. Let's say you click on erectile dysfunction. You'll go through what we call a dynamic online visit, which means that it's smart. So you and I would go through um, two different visits depending on our health background and the questions respond to the answers that we provide. Mm -hmm. And we'll go through everything from your health symptoms about your symptoms and experience with potentially experiencing ED to the, to the question that you asked which is about maybe it's about um, their, lifestyle his, their lifestyle, do they smoke, do they drink, um, their mental health history, their family history, other conditions, other medications they're on. So we do get a holistic picture. We also pull in uh, third-party data about that patient. Um, then that information is analyzed, synthesized, and presented to that physician. And what that allows us to do is the average doctor's visit in the U.S. is about 12 minutes, and patients spend on average about 15 to 20 minutes on the road platform answering those questions. And then what it allows the physician to do is they get to dive in very quickly to the nuance of that patient, right? So if this patient is HIV positive or this patient is a diabetic, they get to dive in and talk to the patient specifically about what makes them unique. They talk to them how? Online? They could do it. It depends on the state, and it also depends on the patient and physician's preference, but they can do it via messaging. They could do it via phone call, or they could do it via video chat. Mm -hmm. It varies depending on the interaction. And sometimes, to your point, um, maybe the physician will uh, think that it's part of a, it's an early symptom of an underlying condition. So they can recommend the best next steps. We ourselves uh, can actually, we have a program to help people quit smoking. Um, so that could be an underlying cause. We also recommend um, and can help guide a patient through the next steps in terms of getting a blood test, seeing if any of their values are, are out of range, and then helping them guide them to the next step. So we really do try to get both launch treatments ourselves that get at the underlying condition, um, educate patients that this is an early symptom, um, and then also help them through those next steps. Uh, but one of the biggest things was the education factor, that people just didn't know that this was even an early sign of some of these more serious conditions. So the, the greatest thing, to your point, is yes, we start by treating that condition, but it actually allows us um, to start that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And anytime you reduce friction to talking to a physician, um, it, the, the patient has that opportunity then to continue the dialogue about other conditions. So is there any risk of patients self-diagnosing and then shopping for the medication that they think will treat their ailment the best? Or is this a situation where the, there's always going to be um, a certain level of interaction to prevent that kind of transaction from yeah, happening? Yeah, so it's always, it's always a dialogue. So we call it patient-led healthcare, um, which means that the patient will come on um, to that doctor's, to that do digital doctor's office and mm -hmm. say, here are my symptoms. Um, sometimes they have no idea what medication um, they think might uh, benefit them. Sometimes they say, I've heard about this or I've tried this before. What do you think about this? So the doctor either makes a recommendation based on no preference or based on a preference, but it is always a dialogue between the patient and the physician. And the physician is ultimately the one who determines this is safe and appropriate, and the patient is ultimately the one who determines whether or not they want to accept that treatment um, and then go from there. 
how often do these interactions lead to an actual prescription versus um, let's talk about this some more, I think you need to go in for some other tests? So only 14% of patients who go th who start that doctor's visit end mm -hmm. up with a prescription. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that prescription, for us, it's very much the start of that relationship. The majority of the communication, um, because, it's, it, because patients always have that one-to-one -one thread with their provider, the majority of it actually happens a great deal after that, right? Because if someone's on the platform for a year or two, they have a lot of, they have an ongoing dialogue with their provider. So talk a little bit about what kind of regulations exist for prescribing drugs online. Yeah. Because obviously our healthcare system is really simple and yes. easy to understand. Oh, completely, <laughs> totally. Um, we refer to it as, as sort of a, a regulatory spider web in the sense that there are so many different regulatory bodies that we have to abide by. Um, but we actually think that that serves as a competitive advantage for the company. Um, when we think about one of our principles is this idea of taking complexity on for our members. So um, in terms of the regulatory bodies that we have to abide by, each state has their own state medical board. Mm -hmm. So that's fifth, we're alive in all 50 states plus DC. So those, that's 51 um, uh, regulatory bodies just on the digital doctor's office side. There's the same on the pharmacy side. So there's the pharmacy uh, boards as well that, re that regulate each individual state. Um, and then there's the FDA uh, that regulates how medication and treatments are talked about, whether mm -hmm. there's fair balance. Um, and then there's the FTC that's regulating different advertisements. So we have to both um, make sure that we respond to the idiosyncrasies of each state, both on the doctor's office side and the pharmacy side, as well as broadly more nationally. And that has implications specifically that the biggest implication is how you establish a patient-physician relationship. So. One of the reasons why we think Roe has uh, been fortunate in terms of the timing um, of the business is that uh, the massive evolution in telemedicine regulation. So starting in actually 2015, that was the last state, Texas was the last state, to permit a patient-physician relationship mm -hmm. to um, take place online. Uh, so now every single state allows you to facilitate that relationship, but the ways in which those states facilitate a patient-physician relationship or articulate the requirements change. So mm -hmm. in some states, they might require you to ask the patient who their primary provider is. In another state, they might require an interaction um, or a dialogue or a real-time audio and visual interaction or a real-time audio interaction. So each state uses its own language. Um, and so our platform actually is built so that on a per condition, per state basis, so you can imagine the permutations we have to account for, per state, per condition basis, depending on um, what diagnostic data is required to mm -hmm. satisfy the standard of care, according to our medical advisory board and physicians on the platform, that is how each interaction is structured and, and built. So this kind of becomes the, the coder's problem to solve, essentially. I would say it's, it's definitely, um, and I, would, I wouldn't want to just say that it's in our, our engineering team. I think our, our legal team would uh, be very frustrated by that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, they, they obviously pour over and, and spend a ton of time. But it's an entire team effort. To, to your point, it not only implicates the software platform, but a lot of the operations as well. Because it could be, it might be the way that a patient-physician relationship is established. It might also be the physical packaging requirements that might change per state, or what has to be included in um, the labeling per state. And so we have to make sure that we respond uh, to each one of those uh, idiosyncrasies per state. A critic would say that while there are a ton of local regulations here, and you're talking about the uh, prescription versus the doctor visits, there's no single federal or state agency that deals with online prescriptions. So as a result, that leaves Roe in a bit of a gray area. Yeah. What do you say to that? Um, I would say that those uh, 104 regulatory bodies, to me, it's the, it's the opposite of a, a gray area in terms of the, the people monitoring our business. So to me, there is no, yes, there is no um, single entity regulating the practice of um, medicine nationally, but there are individual entities that are regulating the practice of medicine on a per state level. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to, um, I would say, the legal environment, right? There are um, national laws and then there are individual state laws. Um, and so if you want to offer a service that is uh, national but um, falls under different state regulation, you have to respond to each one of those. But I, I would say that um, it's, it, to us, it's, it, telemedicine has been around for a really long time. Mm -hmm. It's not something we think we've innovated on the, the way in which these, um, these treatments are, are uh, basically the way in which we give patients additional access and focus. 
um, on certain individual treatments, but the concept of telemedicine and the concept of uh, online pharmacies is not new. Is not a new concept, and so I think there's a lot of precedent to us being able to offer these services. I think the way that we've gone about it is is the is the innovative part. Who are the doctors on these services? Because you mentioned your dad, and he's yeah. an advisor to yeah. to Roe, but obviously he's not the only one dispensing medication no. and, and no. consulting with patients. Do they work full time for Rove? Are how do you ensure their quality when they interact with patients? Do you vet them? Are they yeah. Gig economy doctors, are they supplementing yeah. their existing practice? It's a great question. So all physicians in order to be onboarded go through a rigorous 12-step process that includes everything from medical malpractice, background checks, to individual actually uh, practice cases to see how they would perform, see how they interact with patients. And they sort of go through um, probationary periods to make sure that they can treat more and more patients or be on the broader network. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that they go through a rigorous uh, onboarding process. The types of physicians are um, internists, general practitioners, um, we have hospitalists, or specifically if certain uh, conditions require a specialist, so for example, Rory, um, either... Uh, this is a female vertical. This is a female vertical, yes, thank you. Either exclusively OBGYNs or physicians who have had specific training in uh, women's health will be able to treat conditions that, that fall under that brand. Um, and then in terms of whether it's full-time or part-time, we do have some physicians who are devoted full-time to the platform. And then we have others who um, supplement their, their traditional position um, with uh, practicing on, on row. And I'd say the main benefits that we provide physicians, there's, there's three. The first is the ability to focus on providing great care. So you're, we've read, everyone here has probably read a tremendous amount about um, physician burnout or, or heard it in the news um, because they're they're forced to deal with a lot of the bureaucracy a lot of the paperwork mm -hmm. um, insurance is a huge burden so they spend a lot of time um, not taking care of patients so one of the things that we offer them is the ability to exclusively take care of patients right so they only have to worry about what's best for the patient in interacting with patients they don't have any administrative overhead um, the second is flexibility so they can practice from home or they can practice from an office so we have a lot of stay-at-home dads and moms on the platform who wake up, chop their kids off at school, come home, practice medicine, and then pick their kids up again. Um, and the last one is income. So we, I, we have helped so many providers pay off their student loans, um, which has been an amazing thing that the, the team takes a lot of, a lot of pride in. Um, and on average, our full-time physicians make more than the average PCP in any state across the country. But do, are any of them exclusively your doctors or do they all kind of dabble in So there are practices? some that are, um, I, 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 there are some that are exclusively practicing on row, mm -hmm. um, but we do not, uh, they are not employed by us. So that's an important distinction from a standard of care and practice of medicine standpoint. So the way that our, the way that row makes money or our business model, let's say, I would, I would think about it in two buckets. One, mm -hmm. we have our digital doctor's office and we provide software for that digital doctor's office. And doctor's offices pay us for that software. Mm -hmm. And then patients pay them directly for uh, their consultations. So that's very similar to what would happen in person. And then on the other side of the business, we have a, an online pharmacy. Um, but we've just made it a seamless experience from the patient's perspective. So do you still have to do your own research on the doctors that you see via row? Because it sounds like you're the platform, but you can't necessarily yeah. vouch for everything because they have their own me medical malpractice insurance. Right. And you know, presumably they're qualified, but are you doing the vetting for us? Yes, so we do. We do a lot of the vetting. Uh, we do all of the vetting on behalf of patients mm -hmm. um, and do the monitoring and make sure that they both pass uh, medical malpractice standards as well as do full background checks and constant training, both training on how to use the platform, but also training on we have a limited set of conditions, right? So we're making sure that all of our physicians are up to date on the most current research. Um, and that allows us to, as you po as to your point, we can bring our medical advisory board, um, who are world-renowned physicians, everyone from um, heads of departments at Cornell, um, NYU, previous uh, heads of the DEA, and we can um, work with them to educate the network, right? So they can teach the network, and they can, one of the most amazing things about software is we can take that luxury um, and turn it into a commodity that anyone has access to. What happens if one of the doctors misdiagnoses or misses something and later on it becomes a yeah. bigger condition than anyone realized? Yeah. So one of the most amazing things about telemedicine is there currently actually are no 
uh, lawsuits for telemedicine cases. Uh, uh. And so it's, it's one of the reasons, the main reason is that usually um, a couple things happen. One, you can do certain things in software that are more difficult to do in person. Mm -hmm. So you can have more, more checks in certain instances. Um, and the second thing is you are far more conservative in via telemedicine than you might in person. So someone... That's if they, interesting. Yeah, so if you've known a patient, if a physician has known a patient for 20 years, they might ask different questions than if that's their first interaction. They might be more conservative in that instance. But all of our physicians are required to have medical malpractice, and we make sure that we can accommodate any follow-up if the physician has any questions for the provider, and, and we follow through on that. Now, it strikes me that your business is possible partly because of the patent expiration of certain brand yeah. name drugs, like Viagra, for instance. How much do you think your company, which was founded two years ago, is yeah. a beneficiary of good timing of a lot of these drugs that became available generically? Yeah, so we're in our 23rd uh, month of business. We uh, were extremely, extremely, extremely lucky in terms of the timing. I think um, any business that uh, is in the position that we're in that has grown as quickly as, as we are. I think there's a tremendous amount of luck in, in building any business, and I think that we were particularly fortunate, to your point, with the timing of this. Mm -hmm. So I think there's there's three things there. There's one, the telemedicine regulation that I mentioned before. So now you can use the internet to meet patients, right, or for patients and physicians to connect, where you couldn't use previously the least expensive, most effective distribution mechanism ever invented. So that's one very fortunate timing um, uh, component. The second to your point was these patent expirations. Mm -hmm. So some of the most common chronic conditions, um, the patents expired for these drugs. So everything from uh, cholesterol medication, blood pressure, smoking cessation, ED, hair loss, birth control, um, you name it, it probably, the patent probably expired because there was a massive patent cliff from about 2008 to 2010, and it'll go all the way until about um, 2022, 2024. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll see a lot of these treatments become more and more affordable. The third element um, is actually that deductibles have increased dramatically. So, um, and, and it's important that all three of these things happen simultaneously. So deductibles in 2006, employer-based deductibles, were just over $300. Um, in 2017, uh, those were upwards of $1,500. So they increased 5x. And about 30% of people had a deductible that was more than $2,000. So effectively, a lot of these people were uninsured. So then imagine these three things happening simultaneously. So one, uh, you can now use the internet. Two, you have forced patients to pay for more and more treatments out of pocket, right? So we have forced patients to become consumers and they have to vote with their feet in that instance. They'll have right? to shop around. They have to shop around. So what happens in 2019 when people are forced to shop around? They go to Dr. Google, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so now you can use the internet to meet a doctor. Um, we have forced them to Google. Um, and then we've dropped the price of all these medications. So the three things working simultaneously, um, while all of those three things happen, um, and I'm prescribed a medication that causes me to have erectile dysfunction, so the universe put those four things together. So yes, there is a uh, tremendous amount of luck involved. Mm -hmm. um, you're, yeah, you're, you're completely right. Now, you've pulled in well over $100 million since you were founded. Are you profitable yet? Uh, we are default alive. Uh, so default that is alive. Default alive. Yes. <laughs> Explain so, what default alive yes, means. Yes, that is the. Uh, so I did uh, Y Combinator just after college, and that was I was about 22 years old. Um, mm -hmm. Extremely impressionable, and this is one of the things that left. Uh, so excuse me if it's a little too much YC Kool Aid, uh, but <laughs> default alive and default dead is this concept where um, if everything continues as is right now, if the, if the status quo of your business um, is maintained, so you continue to grow at the same rate your margins stay the same, your, your, uh, the retention on your cohorts stay the same, all of, all of the major, un, major underlying levers of your business stay as is, mm -hmm. um, will you run out of money or will, will you eventually have to raise money again? And for us, we've always maintained default alive where with the money in our bank account, we can achieve profitability. We've raised money um, opportunistically to accelerate that vision, to accelerate the process of our becoming that patient's first call. And what that allows us to do by never needing to raise money or being explicitly dependent on venture capital is that it lets us be far more selective with who our partners are. Um, and it, it lets us ensure that Roe and our investors um, who are becoming part of that, our, our team, are aligned in that, in that vision. So in other words, you're choosing not to be profitable right now yeah. because you're choosing to invest in your business. Right. Well, you know, one, one thing we've seen with um, the 
not so great, not so stellar listings of Uber and Lyft and also WeWork's fall from grace from unicorn darling status yeah. is that suddenly investors care about profitability. It's yeah, not knew? just growth. Yeah. It's, you know, you need to have a path Cash to profitability. Yeah. yeah, you need to make money at some right. point. Yes. What's your path to profitability? So for us, it's interesting. I think when you look at a lot of these businesses, and I won't, I won't comment specifically on, on each one, but a lot of it comes down to the individual unit economics. I think um, the first thing, and Bill Gurley has this amazing post, so if you guys haven't had a chance to read it, I would highly recommend it, but this idea of, all revenue is, is not created equal. Mm -hmm. So the strength of, of the revenue that's that's produced. The, the other thing is whether or not the individual unit economics of the business um, are profitable, right? So every single business could grow really, really quickly um, if it gave out, um, if it basically gave out a dollar and only asked for 80 cents in return. That's a very, you could grow uh, very, very, very quickly. So from our perspective though, if we have strong underlying unit economics, but um, have an opportunity to continue to invest either in the software platform or the infrastructure of our business or um, for those who, again, watch Major League Baseball or um, hopefully other, other uh, spots where our ads are, you'll see that we also invest a, a fair amount in marketing. Um, I am now, it, it's I guess a perk of the job I didn't anticipate, I'm now the official face of erectile dysfunction. Um, <laughs> Which uh, I was telling my partner actually the, the other day uh, when we, we spent um, we spent quite a bit on, on advertisements and, and a couple friends texted me and I looked at her and I said um, first of all I love you second of all um, I liked either, how that started the conversation exactly um, I was like either um, Roe has to work out or we have to work out ideally both but if neither works out. Um, then I will be 30, broke, and the face of erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Which is probably the worst position I could imagine being in in terms of that. Um, so, uh, so back to profitability, um, we, are, we have very, very strong underlying unit economics, and I think it's what separates us. In, in a lot of ways, we've invested in what we call our, our full stack infrastructure. So Roe has built, we've built our own patient application, we built our own physician EMR, we also built and operate our own pharmacy. And so not only does that provide, um, provide great unit economics for the business, which means that every dollar works harder for us than other people who didn't own that from the beginning, mm -hmm. um, but it also lets us offer an unrivaled experience to patients, right? So every prescription that comes in personalized unit dose packages. Um, people have 24-7 access to a pharmacist. The physician and pharmacist can exchange information that they typically couldn't in an in-person physical setting. Um, so to your point, yes, I think a lot, of these, a lot of these companies have invested in unprofitable growth, but I still think that um, the venture community and the, and, uh, the public markets um, can see that all revenue is not created equal, and they care a lot about the underlying strength of the business, which we feel uh, extremely confident about. Do you worry about uh, 2020 and what whatever comes out of it um, might lead to more regulation on healthcare and on insurance and on the ways that the government oversees what goes on in telemedicine? Yes, I think fortunately, in terms of being worried about it, I mean, it's definitely something that we study. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something, again, one of our core principles is to take on the complexity for patients. So as far as more regulation means that we have to build software to accommodate that so that a patient shouldn't really notice any additional regulation um, in terms of, uh, unless it's actually, let, let's say it's requiring a price transparency, obviously they notice things like that. But if it's something that complicates a business's life but shouldn't complicate theirs, hopefully they don't notice. Um, but I think uncertainty about healthcare regulation worries people in, in, in general. Mm -hmm. For us, I think what we're excited by is that um, we really are aligned with the people who are dependent on the success of telemedicine or, or digital health in general. So CMS is a perfect example of that, where the millions of people that are going to enter uh, Medicare over the next 10 years, and you see they're investing in these concepts of virtual visits, remote patient monitoring, asynchronous telemedicine. So they see telemedicine as a way to um, offer scalable, high-quality care. And so I think we're so aligned with that uh, mm -hmm. that we're, we feel very fortunate that we are aligned with the massive trend in, in the ways in which people, in the ways in which uh, the industry is moving. And more specifically, I think that you know when you look at um, the U.S. healthcare system right now, we have a massive provider shortage. Um, and by 2032, we'll have um, we'll be short more than 100,000 PCPs or primary care providers. Um, and so when you have a situation where there are um, too many people 
who need to, the service of too few providers, right? There's a mismatch there in supply and demand. And the only way to, and I'm only using this phrase, it's, it's hopefully uh, not as callous as it sounds, but the only way to get leverage out of a labor force in that way, in order to um, uh, get leverage out of uh, providers is to empower them with technology, right? The only way we as a society have ever been able to do more with less is through technology. So we at Roe see this concept of providing uh, or giving providers superpowers, mm -hmm. right, as a way to scale high quality care. And I think what we're seeing is um, regulators, both at the state and national level, I mean, you see the FDA. Um, expediting the approval of digital health tools. You see them, um, they might not call it superpowers, but they're investing in the same types of concepts. I'm almost certain they don't call it superpowers. Yeah. What about insurance? Does Obamacare or the possible extinction of Obamacare, or the yeah. replacement of Obamacare affect you at all? So right now we don't accept insurance. We will in the future. I think for us, um, and I, ha I could sort of go on a rant forever about insurance, but uh, I think fundamentally, we step out and think more broadly about, about healthcare. Insurance itself is a really bad financial vehicle to fund the majority of healthcare, right? Insurance as a concept is fantastic for events that are rare, mm -hmm. uh, expensive, and uncertain. Um, but that's not the case with a lot of our healthcare needs. Um, and what happens is, and it's, it's really sort of the vestige of a couple regulations that happened in the 40s and 50s. Um, that were unpredictable in terms of the incentives that they set up. But one was um, we froze wages in the early 40s. And what that did was we froze wages, but we allowed um, companies that offered health care for that to not count as part of their wage. So you saw a lot of employers offering employer-based employer -based health insurance. And then in 1954, the IRS granted uh, that benefit as tax deductible. So unknowingly, it actually became financially the most affordable way to I offer see. health insurance. Um, but what ended up happening is when you have, uh, when you actually have, what ended up happening is you removed the patient from being the ultimate insurer of value, right? So what we believe at Roe is that the largest, the single largest problem in the U.S. healthcare system is that patients don't control the flow of funds. When you have a patient control the flow of money, um, inevitably, whether it's a hospital, whether it's um, a provider, um, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, they're incentivized by money, and they will respond to a patient's needs. Um, so even when we do accept insurance, we plan on putting it in the patient's hands. Um, and you see that across, like what we do is look at, if you look at the healthcare system and you say, okay, what products are never covered by insurance? And even use things that are usually cosmetic or um, LASIK eye surgery, breast augmentation, Botox. Um, since LASIK came out, um, technology has improved dramatically and the cost has come down 80%. Because it, it matches other capitalistic industries where um, consumers get to vote with their feet again. Um, or you look at things that are always covered by insurance, that are highly predictable. So giving birth, someone has eight, nine months advance notice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually covered by their insurance company. So they basically get to shop around. And they get to walk around with a multi-thousand dollar voucher. And you see hospitals, if you look at hospitals, then some of the nicest wards are maternity wards um, because Patients in that instance are shopping. Mm -hmm. And so for us, regardless of whether it's covered by insurance um, or cash pay, and I do think you see a lot of benefits and you see a lot of innovation in the cash pay um, region, um, it's, it's about empowering the patient to choose where the money goes. Uh, so I think that's our big focus, regardless of whether it's cash pay or insurance. Let's talk a little bit about the different brands that make up Roe, yeah. because Roe is kind of the umbrella, yes. right? For uh, Roman, which is for men's health, and then you, has, you also have Rory for women's health, specifically yeah. menopausal women, uh, and then you also have Zero, which is your smoking cessation program. Talk a little bit about Rory, um, and I mean, obviously, there's not there's a distinct audience for Roman and Rory, but how yeah. much overlap is there with Zero, for instance, and yeah. how did you decide to build out Rory? Was it simply because Roman had a lot of potential, and you know, oh, we need to offer something for women as well? Yeah. It's a great question. So there's there's so much there. One is I think that uh, so I would say Rory has now um, broadened out to just be more broadly women's health. Um, okay. The initial products focused on uh, peri and menopausal women, but it has, has since brought broadened down, and it does actually offer some products that are some of our products are on both Roman and Rory, um, general herpes, uh, cold sores, to to name um, two examples. There's a common theme here. These are all kind of things that 
people feel uncomfortable about seeing their doctor. Definitely. To um, we don't get, as much as I would love if we did, um, we don't get a tremendous amount of word of mouth, right? So we don't get, we get one to one word of mouth. Mm -hmm. But we don't get Instagram unboxing experiences about uh, general herpes medication Probably as not, much no. as I would as much as I would love to to see that happen. And we get a couple, but not as much as That'd probably other other consumer brands. Um, the reason I think they're they're separated is um, one, I think that it's important that people feel extremely comfortable and safe in the environment when they see a physician. Um, now we actually have some women. Uh, who the brand of Roman resonates with them. And so their, their biological sex uh, is, is female, but they still select the Roman brand, and, and we have vice versa. We have some men who um, they resonate um, more with the Rory brand, and so mm -hmm. they, they use Rory. But I think it's really important that people feel extremely comfortable in, in that environment. Um, so I think you'll also see us have, um, if, if the, the brand requires, or if, or if the specific condition requires someone to specify their biological sex, mm -hmm. um, but we won't, we won't dictate which brand um, that, that individual goes to. Um, but I do think that we've seen success in terms of, because we don't get that word of mouth, a lot of our um, new patients does come from performance marketing mm -hmm. or, and, and digital acquisition channels. Um, and when you can have a brand that does speak in certain instances specifically to the gender that someone identifies with, um, we find that the brands resonate very quickly, um, but we do give anyone the option to, to choose whichever they wish. You mentioned uh, telemedicine, how it's expanding the, the growth of it, the potential there. What do you see as the limits of telemedicine? Are there areas that you would like to expand the business to, but you simply can't because of those limits? Yeah. So ultimately, physicians are limited, and providers in general, um, are limited by diagnostic data. Mm -hmm. So the more diagnostic data that they have, the more conditions that they can treat. So right now we go off of self-reported data, we go off of some third-party data, and we go off of diagnostic imaging, so pictures that, that patients uh, submit and, and upload. And then visual uh, video confirmation depending on the condition and depending on the physician. Um, but right now, for example, I'm wearing an EKG on my wrist. Um, and you think about the concept of you, you, know, you go to the doctor every year or every other year, but um, A, people's heart rate can increase in their doctor's office, so can their blood pressure, there's, there's white coat syndrome. But your heart's going to beat 3 billion times over the course of your life, and you're going to take about 600 million breaths. The idea that we only get a couple of those is kind of preposterous when we think about treating someone holistically. So ideally, we're able to collect far more data, and that'll expand the complexity of the conditions that we can treat as a platform. But it takes time, right? So this came out a year ago on my wrist. Um, if we look at the iPhone, for example, it came out in 2008. Snapchat was invented in 2011. So sometimes it takes a lot of these, um, it takes some of these devices or some of these mechanisms to collect more and more data. It takes time for them to spread. Um, but we think that there's tremendous potential to both get a lot of the vitals that our body is, is producing constantly, um, as well as actually uh, there's a new wave of a lot of these at-home tests, right? So there's blood, spit, mm -hmm. urine, feces, swabs, a lot of these things that can help detect anything from whether someone's HIV positive to helping them manage their cholesterol um, over time and, and manage their heart disease more broadly. So we think there's tremendous potential. I would say that it, it does come down to a spectrum of diagnostic data. Mm. Right now, telemedicine is limited by whatever we can collect from the patient directly. Um, and ideally, that spectrum becomes, frankly, less and less over time. I think the, the banking system is a great analogy for that. Right? We used to do what we do now online. We used to be forced to do in person. But for still the extremely complicated things, it still makes sense to go in person. And so we think of telemedicine a lot as a complement to someone's primary care. It is by no means a replacement. And so when we think about being that patient's first call, a lot of those first calls will be, hey, I think you should see someone in person, and here's a yeah. person located closest to you based on your zip code. So I think for us, telemedicine doesn't have to mean end-to-end -end treatment. It mm. can sometimes be the first point of triage. Um, so I think that's how, that's how we think a lot about it. Follow the data, in other yes. words. OK, let's get to our lightning round. We have a couple of quick questions before I open things up to the audience. Um, we've seen your ads in different yes. places. You mentioned baseball. Um, it's also available on the subway. What's, what, What's the last time you bought, when's the last time you bought something based on advertisement in the subway? Last time I bought something was a Casper mattress. Ah, yes. and that worked out well. It worked out extremely well, I love it. When's the last time you went to a doctor's office the old fashioned way and had uh, an old fashioned consult? Within the last year, uh, so our cardiologist had a wonderful stress test. And you've passed with flying colors. Passed with flying colors. All right, a startup that you admire. A startup, oh a startup that I admire. 
Um, I would say I actually admire uh, Pill Club and, and New RX are two in, in our space that I really admire. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they both provide access in, in, in different ways, but um, to contraception and to prep, uh, which I think are both tremendously uh, great for the world. You have this ongoing sponsorship deal with the MLB, Major League yes. Baseball. We talked about seeing your ads Proud sponsor during the Baseball. playoff series, um, especially when they went extra innings. The yes. Yankees were blew it. Anyway. More ad um, inventory. We love extra innings. <laughs> more ad inventory. Um, did you gain any MLB players as customers? So um, I have no idea. Um, but, oh, come on. The data's um, there. I, have, I actually, I, I, can, I can't even see our patients. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. But that's, uh, that's for security purposes, but I have no idea. I can tell you that we did an amazing partnership with uh, Big Poppy or David Ortiz mm -hmm. um, for prostate cancer awareness um, during uh, during the month of, of Father's Day, So, um, which was amazing. And we partnered also with the Prostate Cancer Awareness Foundation and have an education hub on our platform. So um, that is just another way that we work with the MLB. Uh, but that was, a, that was an exciting initiative that we did. Okay, final question. You have a very specific dress code. I do, yeah. Um, you're wearing all black right yes. now, right? Black t-shirt, black pants, black mm -hmm. sneakers. Uh, you have basically three pairs of pants, one pair of shoes for each occasion. I and do. Plain T-shirts. Yes. Walk us through how this developed. So, uh, how, how it developed. Uh, this is definitely going to be an embarrassing story. So, I got an executive coach as, as part of this process, which highly recommend for for any founder going through this. Um, and uh, they do a 360 feedback process. So they uh, interview your co-founders, your reports, your board, everyone. And one resounding piece of feedback uh, was that I. Um, Dressed like a homeless person, they did, was like I had I had holes in my sho shoes and shorts and t-shirts, and they just did not uh, did not approve given where our company was, um, and so my uh, loving partner and my mom decided to for my birthday they teamed up and they did this wonderful thing uh, where they threw out half my closet. It was like an intervention. Um, it was a, definitely an intervention, <laughs> and then they uh, purchased some of the clothes that you're seeing right now. Um, and they basically did it in a way which um, was, was pretty genius, actually. So they put the pants, shirts, and jackets um, organized in the closet in a way in which you can technically get dressed in the dark and everything will work together. Um, and so it's all about, I mean, it's nice because I look like an adult <laughs> sometimes. Um, and uh, I, which we talked about a little bit, but you make fewer decisions every day. So you do have decision fatigue by the end of the day. And if you're not thinking about, does this shirt match with these pants, these shoes? Not that there's anything wrong if someone wants to spend time on that. Right. But um, this is a significant upgrade to what I was uh, using before. <laughs> so yeah, that's a little bit about. We need a before and after exactly. picture. Yeah. All right, Zach Raitano, thank you so much, CEO you. and co-founder of. Thank Rome. you guys for having me. Before you